Welcome to our group's Partner Perspectives, an interview series which highlights our partners' missions, their visionary leadership, and the impact of our collaborations. I'm Amanda Nelson, Vice President at Or Group, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Ruth McFarlane, Chief Advancement Officer for the Ms. Foundation for Women. Thank you, Ruth, for joining us. Before we get started, uh, would just love um, for you to give us an overview of the Ms. Foundation mission and the work that you're doing with them. Great. Um, so happy to be here with you today, Amanda. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, Ms. Foundation for Women. So we have been, it is actually our 50th anniversary year. We've been around for 50 years. Um, and the mission from the beginning has been the same, to build the collective power of women and girls in the United States. Um, today, our work really focuses at the intersection of gender and race, and we're specifically focusing on um, issues impacting the lives of women and girls of color. The way that we are building collective power is sort of threefold. Uh, we make grants, of course, um, to grassroots leaders across the country. Um, most oftentimes, these are women of color leading or small organizations with uh, budgets of a million dollars or much, much less, um, very small staff, and looking at really a whole span of different ways in which they're engaging their community and different strategies they're using to advance um, advance a social justice mission around gender and race. We also model uh, trust-based philanthropy for, philan for philanthropy and pride ourselves on doing that and, and really advocate for the type of philanthropic practices that are useful to the field. And then lastly, we are often, as the oldest and largest um, national women's fund, we are often in rooms and at tables where there aren't any women, other women's funds or organizations represented. And so very frequently, the Ms. Foundation is also a voice and can amplify that amazing work happening at the grassroots and also um, some of the changes that are possible at the top. Um, and so we, we have a, a really uh, wonderful mission as a collaborative fund, you know, raising money and then making sure it gets where it needs to go. I love what you said about, uh, you know, the history and also some of the trends and industry insights that you have. So would love to hear more about that. You have over 20 years of professional experience in the social sector and have seen a lot of changes across the philanthropic landscape and been a part of a lot of those changes. Could you share more specifically some trends and opportunities that you've observed and how those are shaping your approach uh, to work at the Ms. Foundation? Yeah, definitely. I think, I mean, I think what I need to say is that it is not business as usual anymore. Um, and for me, that's great because I never really liked business as usual in the first place and <laughs> might be why I'm at Ms. Um but yeah, in, in terms of fundraising opportunities, in terms of the way that you prospect, you know, for opportunities, it's not the same anymore. We're finding with the great transfer of wealth that's happening and has been happening, donors, prospect of donors are younger, they're better organized, they're really informed, they're interested in intergenerational giving in ways that they hadn't been before. So thinking about working with co corporations and institutions, similarly, corporations are looking at social just the social justice space and social change and funding that in different ways thinking about how that aligns with their brand in really different ways and you've got younger leaders in the corporate sector as well so you also have this generational shift in perspective there um too and then i think another place we're seeing real change is is how you cultivate the folks that your your long term relationships it used to be in-person meetings and galas and all of these sorts of things. And while those are still important, we're needing to be, one, the pandemic required everyone to be super nimble about how you build relationship across time and space. But I think there's a real opportunity for us to look at the content that we're providing when we meet with folks. It's more than just, you know, are they getting to meet the CEO or who's the big name in the room? It's Or is it a fancy occasion that they can wear their very shiny best? You know, sometimes folks now really want uh, a different type of content experience. And so really thinking as at the Miss Foundation about what we have to share that would be particularly interesting and um, illuminating for our audiences and how bringing bringing people along on an educational journey can also help form community 
and then help us to think how we are all working together, right, to advance a mission rather than, you know, just simply writing a check and and being entertained for an evening. It's it's not that's not what folks are looking for anymore. So there's a lot of opportunity to do things differently and. And uh, with a new community, you know, at Ms. with so many, we're, we're led right now. It's really exciting. We, we are completely led by women of color and our staff is over 80% women of color as well. And so we're able to bring a lot of cultural, um, new cultural perspectives, a new sort of perspective on identity and lived experience to what we do. Um, and I think that just makes us all the more creative and innovative about how we do things. I'd love to talk more about leadership and some of the challenges and successes that you, you just you know listed. But you didn't start your career uh, in the nonprofit sector. You were actually an attorney and in various leadership roles at different social change organizations. I'd love to hear more about some of the notable challenges you faced in your career um, in the fight for gender and racial equity, how your team at the Ms. Foundation is working to overcome this in their everyday work. And um, finally, you know, what are you most proud of? What are the most significant milestones that you feel that you've been able to achieve in your work at the Ms. Foundation for Women? Sure. So I, yeah, as you mentioned, I started off, I've had many journeys. <laughs> I started off as a lawyer. I became a social worker. I got into development a little later on um, and now have been charged with building an advancement team at Ms., which is an integrated communications and fundraising team. Um, I think starting with your last question, that's probably the thing I'm most proud of recently <laughs> is having been able to do that at Ms. and do it well. And we've got a really strong, well-integrated um, team. But going back a bit, you know, before I was at Ms., I was at the National Center for Lesbian Rights and I was there serving on the board and then on the staff um, as the fight for marriage was happening. And that really opened my eyes to... Um, you know, not so much. It didn't really open my eyes to the challenge that we faced in the LGBT community. It opened my eyes to the importance of everyone being involved in a solution. And the tide for marriage shifted when we were able to get the message out to just regular people across the country that love was a universal Right. And that this wasn't getting it wasn't about the wonky set of political rights that also mattered. Right. And, and with marriage. But it was that love is a universal. And that was something everyone could get behind. And we needed literally everyone behind it in order to win. Um, so that's, you know, when I when I think about the work we do now, women and girls of, of color in this country are severely under resourced. Women of color leaders are severely under resourced in some of the research. Um, we've done at Ms. has really been on the cutting edge of putting a number to that. And we learned that half a penny of every philanthropic dollar actually goes to support the leadership and work of women of color across the country. And when you're looking regionally, it's half of that again, <laughs> if you're looking at the Midwest and the South. And so one of the things that my team is working on collectively across comms and fundraising, and honestly, the staff at large, is shifting that and moving that needle. Um, in the fundraising side of things, it's really starting to activate our donors to understand and embrace, we say fall in love with the problem, you know, <laughs> embrace the problem and understand that it is a long-term, it's gonna require a long-term commitment to change such an under-resourced um, landscape. And we were focusing specifically on the Midwest and the South in our grant making and in our fundraising um, relationship building. And then from a communications perspective, it's getting that pocket change research out. So, of course, we have the, the seminal, the first um, study that we published in 2020 on our website. And this fall, we will be um, publishing and releasing a second study that looks um, gives more of a qualitative story um, overlay to the numbers and quantitative um, research that was provided in the first publication. But in this fall, this fall's publication, you'll really get to hear what it, the impact and the toll that it takes on women of leaders to be so under-resourced and the kinds of things they do to make it work anyway. Um, and then we're really excited to have just been funded um, by the Gates Foundation to continue to do this research for the next five years. So we will have subsequent studies and we'll be able to update and show 
um, where the philanthropic sector has really shifted around this issue. So that's very exciting. I, I love what you were saying about it taking all of us. So speaking of taking all of us, I'd love to talk a little bit about the Creating the Future We Deserve campaign that we're helping support the Ms. Foundation on and the impact of our collaboration and partnership together. When we met, uh, we talked about our model of coming in to be embedded partners. And I remember you saying you weren't totally sure about what that meant. <laughs> so would love to talk about our work with you, you know, through our interim support in fundraising to our strategy in thinking about and building a campaign plan and now in helping partner with you day to day and the team in fundraising for this $100 million campaign. Uh, would be great to hear more about your thoughts on that embedded partnership and some instances where or group has added value, helped fuel your work, help you know with the capacity um, for your team uh, in any uh, way that we've been able to contribute to your organization's strategic advancement in this way. I love that you uh, reminded me of my, I, I wouldn't say I was skeptical, but I was cautious. <laughs> At the beginning. And I think that makes sense, right? Because when you're talking with a consultant, the idea that they will be, you know, they're going to embed can feel like, oh, well, what's that going to mean for us? Is that going to be just extra work for the team? How effectively can these people that we don't know yet really embed, right? Um, but I was curious about it because what I knew I needed was capacity. I knew we needed more than anything. We, we had a very small team. And as I said, I was building a team. And so I had a very young team. I had a lot of gaps in systems, you know, and we needed to do this enormous campaign um, for the 50th anniversary year. And I wanted to do it short. It's short and sweet. It's 18 months um, and we're raising a hundred million dollars. So that's no small task. Um, and as I got to know you all, and as I've told you, you know, the the highest value, I think, there are many, many ways in which you all have had tremendous value for the Miss Foundation. But I think the highest value has been that embeddedness. I would say your staff and mine are integrated. I wouldn't even use the word embedded. I would say you are integrated with us. And, and what that looks like is you have true, genuine passion and excitement for our work. You've got skin in the game the same way we do. You know, I've seen, I've seen your folks um, at the front door at our gala, checking in donors and guests and have heard back from those people how friendly, oh, Ruth, your team is so friendly. And I'm thinking, oh, wait, that's Orr's team that was at the at the front, which is incredible. And I've seen folks on your team present, you know, during, you know, day day long strategy sessions and just even you and I getting a chance to talk about how our respective team members are growing and developing and what we can do jointly to make sure that this experience um, is meaningful for them. That for me is the number one value add. Um, in addition, you are a hugely important expert resource for us. And so as I've gone warp speed building this thing um, and trying to take advantage of opportunities kind of as they arise in creative ways, it's been incredibly helpful to have your counsel um, and the counsel of some of Steve and others of, of your colleagues um, as we've tried to really think in a creative way about what we were talking about earlier, how do we meet donors and supporters where they are right now? Um, one of the things I wanted to do with this campaign was really emphasize planned giving in a way that was a little unusual and certainly something that Ms. hadn't done before. And But it would allow us to start conversations with longtime donors and start conversations with brand new people in a place that everyone could relate to. Everyone kind of has to plan, you know, do estate planning. A lot of folks have been working on their wills during the pandemic. It's something that's on our minds. Um, and with the transfer of wealth that's happening, it's something that's on people's minds. And so we wanted to do this a little differently, and I couldn't have constructed it without your guidance and your help on that um, at all. So I, I guess the last thing I want to make sure I say is, is you're really the best of the best when it comes to uh, working with an organization that has a social justice mission aligned um, structure, because you actually truly understand and value that. Um, and that makes a big difference to us as well. 
you has learned so much about your culture and it, it, it's so special and unique. And it's been such a privilege for us, not only to be a part of the mission and the campaign, but to work alongside you and to be a part of the culture that you've built at the Ms. Foundation for Women. I think it's affected all of us in our own professional leadership and style and considerations. And it's something we really value as well and are really proud of the work we're doing together. Well, my last question before I get all choked up <laughs> is uh, more broad actually about uh, insights you have for other nonprofit executives that out there that are thinking about campaigns, that are thinking about creative approaches. Uh, you have such a unique experience and perspective in your career it would be great to hear from you um, any advice that you have for other fellow nonprofit leaders who are working to achieve impact and, and enact social change. You know, what should they be thinking about? All right. Yeah, I think, you know, when I think about some of the biggest challenges or shifts that are facing leaders like me right now, it is we have more generations in the workplace than has ever been. We have four. <laughs> generations in the workplace. And that is not easy at all. And specifically when you're working in um, a sector that's all about relationships, that is something you really, you have to be so nimble and so creative because each relationship represents a different generation. And usually the 2P2 or more people involved represent multiple generations. So what I have done that I think has served me really well here and elsewhere has been number one, prioritize the culture of your team and the culture of your organization. Whether, you know, I'm going to assume the vision is grand and wonderful, and I'm going to assume the strategic planning is on point. But as you're doing all of that stuff, you've got to be centering the culture that you have in mind and verbalizing it, demonstrating it, modeling it, and tending to it like a garden because like a garden, there's a new weed growing up every day. <laughs> there's some little squirrely thing out there every day that needs to be tended to. There's a new beautiful flower coming in every day. And so it really takes a hands-on approach. Um, and then the other thing to remember in this work is that these relationships demand authenticity. And I always keep in mind that I am asking this team to do something that is really, really significant and personal because to be in deep, meaningful relationship with someone takes bravery, it takes self-knowledge, and I'm actually asking you to stretch and grow in a way that I have to be ready to support and witness and celebrate and all of that. So it's some of this, you know, it's not the hard science piece of it. That stuff's critical. You got to, I mean, you hire or group <laughs> to help you have an excellent strategy and good bones and a timeline and all the things. And then you take good, good, good care of your people because they're going to be the ones generating the amazing ideas in the future. And they're your most valuable resource. Thank you for that wise advice and very manageable perspective that other leaders can absolutely be thinking about and considering and really appreciate you sharing that and sharing the experiences that you and your team have had at the Ms. Foundation for Women. Ruth, this has been a delight to talk to you today. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you everyone for watching our Org Group Partner Perspective. Happy to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you.